Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 8 of Wound Season 4. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily, and producer, Neil. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. How does fried chicken and cornbread sound, Johnny? Great! Will Uncle Connor be here? And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is I Know Why the Caged Cat Sings. The release date was November 25th of 2021. The in-episode dates were April 21st and 22nd. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Fintin Hoik. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits go to Logan Browning as Onyx. Zara Fuzzle as Cassandra Savage, Leon Nguyen Harper, and Martha Kent. Oded Fair as Rachel Gu. Greg Griffin as Lois Lane. Josh Keaton as Black Spider and Red Hooded Ninja. Uh, Joel Sueto as Shade. Gwendolyn Yao as Lady Shiva. And Kyun Young as O-Sensei. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens with a throwback to Season 1, to Cheshire and Artemis' original confrontation back in Infiltrator. We then cut back to Santa Prisca in the present day, where the two sisters face off against Lady Shiva. After the credits, Artemis stalls so Orphan can pick the locks on her chains, and Cassandra and Lady Shiva reveal their whole plan and explain everything that's happened in the arc so far (laughs) as a catch-up for all of us, in case there was any confusion. (laughs) So their whole plan was as follows. Sending Cassandra in as a fake mole to steal the League's secrets using organic versions of the original infiltrators from Season 1, as well as kidnapping Orphan and using Onyx as an unknowing distraction by setting her up to overhear their plans to send Cassandra in as a mole and then letting her escape to warn the team, thus sowing further dissent and confusion and prolonging any decision about Cassandra, giving her enough time to steal the information the Shadows were after in the first place. You know, your simple everyday plan. And once the villain monologuing is over, Orphan finally breaks out of her chains, kills the lights, and an epic battle ensues in the dark. But when the shadows eventually get the lights back on, there's some irony there, Artemis and company escape with the help of Shade, who still owes Cheshire a favor from last season. But unfortunately, Lady Shiva follows them through the shadow portal onto the beach of Santa Prisca. Meanwhile, back in Smallville, Superman explains the concept of death to Johnny, telling him that Superboy isn't coming back and making me cry making Along all of us probably cry. one or two other people probably back on the beach on santa prisca lady shiva insists that orphans stay behind threatening everyone threatening everyone cassandra cares about especially barbara gordon which prompts orphan to fight back and ultimately stab her own mother but barbara is able to talk orphan down from actually killing lady shiva and our heroes are able to escape santa prisca on the super cycle In a flashback, we see what happened after Cheshire and Artemis parted ways in Infiltrator. Since they told Cheshire to try and recruit Artemis for the Shadows, while Paula told Artemis to try to turn Cheshire back onto the right path. Artemis and co. then retreat to a safe house in Key West, where Artemis makes a call to Will to ask if Jade can come back to Star City. But seeing Leon wearing her Cheshire mask freaks Jade out, and she runs off into the night leaving us all confused and back in smallville clark and lois have a heart to heart about connor's death again making us all cry and meanwhile artemis onyx and cassandra track cheshire back to infinity island in flashback we see artemis and cheshire have a confrontation on a rooftop sometime after infiltrator where artemis tries to reason with jade and jade insists that the team would never trust her if they knew the truth about who she is On Infinity Island, Cheshire confronts Sensei, but Artemis intervenes, leading Jade to finally confess that she left Will and Leon in the first place because she was worried about being too much like her father and making Leon turn out like her. 
Artemis tries to reason with her and tell her that their past and their family doesn't have to define them and their future, but Cheshire thinks she'd only be putting Will and Leon in danger by dragging them back into her life. Onyx chimes in, saying she's faced some of the same struggles, joining the shadows because she was frustrated with the system and her lack of agency in it. But now she feels trapped in her training. Sensei then reminds both of them that the shadows weren't actually a family, but a manipulation that turned all of its recruits into weapons. Rachel, Ghoul, and Sensei offer to help Cheshire and Onyx rehabilitate themselves and free themselves of their former shadow training. Jade and Onyx both accept, with, with Artemis stipulating that she has to be allowed to come back at any time to check on Jade, which Rachel Ghoul happily agrees to. And in a final montage, we see that everyone is finally getting it back together, including the villains, the Kent family enjoying themselves on the farm, Orphan and Barbara reuniting in Gotham, the the Infinity Island. <laughs> nope, that was fun. yep. I know we've called it that before. It's still funny to read out loud. The Infinity <laughs> Island Therapy Group meditating together. Cassandra reporting to her father, Vandal Savage, Lady Shiva contemplating her daughter's escape, and Artemis returning home to her extended family in Star City. Let's feel some Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. A lot happens in this one. It does. What, what you got, Emily? A lot of things. Let me scroll through and look at all my stuff. We will, we will be having English class later, but let's start off with some other more Young Justice-focused things for a moment. I will point out, this is a small thing. We've been talking a lot about Barbara and Orphan and everything. In this episode, at one point, Barbara over overcomes, tells Artemis, we can't ask her to fight her own mom, which is, to me, both hilarious and ironic when it's directed at Artemis, who has been asked to fight her entire family like five times in season one. <laughs> like, I get that part of it is that Orphan is supposed to be younger and her mother is supposed to be exceptionally more dangerous than uh artemis's family but still of all the people that could have been said to it's the most ironic choice <laughs> is sportsmaster she was definitely more dangerous and she's awful yeah is it is sportsmaster just more annoying i don't know man is that why everybody's like no kick that guy in the face we're all gonna kill a kick that guy in the face kick him in the face a lot you know what let's stick him in some mud shiva stays hidden more that's what it is. She was, she, <coughs> that's she what it is, is. Literally in the shadow. Yeah, that's true. Hashtag I hate Sportsmaster. To move over to a to a different, um, more <laughs> more well adjusted family, shall we say? We've got to add uh, Superman calmly and compassionately explains the concept of death and grief to a child to the list of things this season that made me sob because it's not fair. <laughs> It's just a very good scene. I know, Neil, you've got some notes on this scene, but it's so well done and so painful at the same time. Yeah. I'm, I mean, speaking as a hospice nurse, I was I was pretty impressed by that whole scene. And then, um, uh, Neil, you've got a, uh, a link. We'll put this link in the show notes. You want to talk about that? Yeah. When it originally happened, like Greg very openly credited his daughter, Erin, as one of the people that really helped. Make that land. I mean, that's that's a tough that's a tough plane to build, and an even tougher plane to land, um, and it not feel wrong or just not right. I think not right is probably a better way to say it. Um, and that landed in a way that is just like, wow, that's devastatingly accurate and good. And yeah. I hope, I hope, if I ever find myself in a scenario like that, that I am even half as good is what was delivered. If nothing else, I may show someone that scene alone um, just to help along. But we have a link to a podcast where um, Aaron is actually being interviewed by a couple of people. Um, and it's about a half hour long. So if you're interested in more of that, um, there'll be a link there in the show notes. Um, other things for this episode, we got, I, I think it's very interesting this episode that we get a different take on one of the big themes of the series that has always been in there is like the idea of you're not the weapon you were designed to be, which we often credit as being a part of like Superboy's storyline and stuff. But seeing that theme addressed differently through Orphan and Artemis and Cheshire and all of those things is really interesting and really just really well done in this arc of seeing all of these different people grapple with this idea of like, you were not literally built to be a weapon. But everyone in your life for your formative years tried to shape you into something that you don't want to be anymore. And how do you break out of that? And showing 
that Artemis broke out of that through years of having people support her and Orphan was able to have a similar support system on a much shorter timeline, but still there. And that Cheshire is just kind of struggling to find that. And if she is worthy of that and all of those things, it's just really interesting to see. It's a very good scene. It's a very good episode. Yeah, and a note that I have that I I mean, I realize now ties so much to that is how far Artemis has come from those sort of things is when Race shows up, she's the only one that doesn't bow. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. which is so interesting to think about the people that you know, the people that do, and you're like, Well, of course they do. And then the the two that I think of that it surprised me a little are Onyx and Cheshire. Like they yeah. they bow immediately. It's like, Oh, it's still in there. It's Yeah. I thought it's such a good detail. And she's just standing there like, oh, okay. And he's like, just as your friend says, I never, you know, I don't tell a lie. I'm Rachel Ghoul. That's right. <laughs> and also with that scene, I love that it's part of the trajectory of this arc is leading up to that exact moment where Cheshire finally snaps and says, I left because I was worried I'm too much like dad is so good, especially because I think fans have been asking that question since early season three of going why did jade why did jade leave why and like the show has given us hints and has given us other people's assumptions up until this point we have never had jade actually say why she left like we've had will assume it's just because oh you can't deal with how quiet life is and how slow life is or artemis like oh you left because you were worried about putting people in danger or all of these things of other people trying to say oh this is why you left and to have jade finally say what it is and i feel like it's not necessarily what anyone expects to be her answer because we have heard so many other people give their answers in the show but the second she said it it's like oh oh that's that's one of the most interesting answers we could have picked as the canon reason that Jade says she left because it is such an honest and complicated fear to give her as a character, especially when we've been seeing all of these flashbacks, this arc of like what Artemis and Jade actually went through and to hear that Jade's biggest worry is that she is going to do that to her own kid and that she doesn't want to is heartbreaking and so well executed and i like it a lot thoughts <laughs> i agree with everything that you just said so like the wrestling match and the the assumptions so people are often much deeper with more complex motivations than we give anybody credit for yep similar to this thing about talking to a kid about death when you're talking to a child about death it's not what what is going on in your head is not necessarily what's going on in the kid's head when you're having that conversation. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But to ask Jade and to have Jade reflect on it and have me thought about it, she kept trying to come back or wanting to come back. It's not that she doesn't want to come back. Yeah. It's that there's a part of her that wants to be, quote unquote, a good mom and is trying to do the best she can. And sometimes the best you can might not be bad, right? have its other issues right so a dad who becomes uninvolved with their kids because perhaps they didn't have a great dad and they don't have good examples and so they don't want to make things worse so then they become an absentee dad in the house right like there's a reason there's a thought process there that that might be deeper than we think of like well they just don't care it may not be there. I don't know. But people are more complicated than you think. And to have her say, like, I am too much like dad. And I am worried that even with my best intentions, this is the this is the person I had as an example. So when I don't know what to do, I'm I'm gonna fall back on what I know, whether I want to or not sometimes. And that's I think any every parent can relate to the idea of, oh, that was my mom coming out of my mouth or that was my dad that just came out of my mouth for good or bad right and then having to try to actively choose to do something else so i i think it was brilliantly done and i love the bonding moment i want to believe this rehabilitation thing so bad (laughs) and i i would i have made the same decision in the moment like i felt the exact same way artemis did i'm like this could be a good step this is good and on reflection i'm like what am i thinking so like I don't I don't know. We'll have to see. You know, Rachel's like, we're welcome to meet back anytime. 
Okay, Rish. Yeah. All right. And I also think the fact that it's that in this confrontation, it's Jade finally admitting to herself that that's what she's afraid of is such a big step towards that not being what happens to her. You know what I mean? Of like the being aware of it and being worried about that is the first step to avoiding that kind of behavior on a lot of levels, I feel like. And that's just it's good. Jade's a cool character because and especially because we see it tied into like all of the flashbacks and it gives a lot of meaning to some of those flashbacks like her confrontation with artemis in uh the flashback in this episode that's set after infiltrator she freaks out and shouts i'm nothing like dad and then has to like pull herself back together before she can keep talking and like that's been a thing she's done kind of the whole whole series to on to different extents and in different contexts she she hates sportsmaster and doesn't want to deal with him and like adding this layer that part of part of that is having a horrible childhood that she resents sportsmaster and everything he's done to her and part of that is being worried about following in every single one of his footsteps and that's just such a fascinating character arc to get to see and i would love to see more of cheshire i love cheshire which is one of my favorite things about this arc <laughs> yeah it's real good all of it is really really good um and you have to spin off with you know, infinity island also, Therapy. also, she is so awful at sneaking up on any of her family members. Just husband, father, <laughs> so sister. Just, just not good at it. Just everybody knows you did it. Hey, come on back. I, like I assume that Artemis knew the second she was doing it. She's like, I'm just going to afford her the opportunity to come in on her own. Okay, she did not. I will go outside and I will discuss. <laughs> and I, we will discuss from this point forward. Um, but just so good with sneaking up on anyone that is not her family is so very bad when they are. That's funny. It's a tie into what Neil just said. I do want to say it is my one big problem with this arc is let Jade and Will share 10 seconds of screen time. Please, please, I ask for so little. It's hilarious looking back on this arc, how much they almost run into each other. Like at every possible opportunity, it's like Will is two seconds away from walking through that door and it never happens multiple times. And that's hilarious. And I just got to say it because I I miss them interacting. They're fun. (laughs) Let them talk. Let Will be aware of this whole Infinity Island plan. We'll get into it. But shall I do an English lesson? Would you guys like to hear about a book? Yeah. So the title, obviously, we're talking about how she teaches comparative lit. So that's where all these titles are coming from. But you had some details. You you actually recently read through I Know Why the Cage Bird which Sings. Is, yeah. Which is a book that Artemis is reading when Jade is doing a terrible yeah. job sneaking up on him. <laughs> right. And is where both the title and the quote at the end of the episode come from. So I read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings at some point after watching season four, because this was my homework between seasons. <laughs> and so I Know Why the Caged Bird Sing is the first of a series of memoirs written by celebrated author and poet Maya Angelou, for anyone who doesn't know. Here is your quick summary of that. It was originally published in 1969 and deals with her childhood and early adolescence in the 30s and 40s. It's often called a modern classic and is seen as especially important in the canon of African-American literature. It is moving and heartbreaking and and super influential piece of writing that was really interesting to read because I, unlike Artemis, I had never read it in high school. But yeah, it's really interesting. And now here's how it ties into a superhero cartoon. (laughs) Sometimes this is weird. So these were the notes that I originally took uh, while reading this a while back of just kind of some bullet points that connect this book to Artemis and Jade and their whole storyline specifically. So the book uh, deals with a lot of complicated family dynamics. Maya Angelou is the younger sister of an older sibling who does eventually walk out of her life. They are both uh, the result of a very contentious and now separated marriage and They're sent from one single parent home to another is multiple plot points in this book uh, and is also, you know, stuff Artemis and Jade went through. 
Uh, there's an emphasis in the book on a childhood love of literature and reading and how those things can help and shape you as you grow older, which of course ties into everything we've seen of Artemis in flashbacks, reading every book she can get her hands on until she becomes a comparative lit professor at a very young age <laughs> to be a full professor. Right. The book is often noted, especially for its very honest discussions of poverty and racism and education as a possible way to try and get out of some of those systematic and institutional struggles, which is touched on a little bit in Artemis's arc in season one of how her mom is very insistent about her going to a better school just to get out of the life that they're stuck in in a lot of ways. And uh, of course, the one of the very notable things about I know why the cage bird thing is that it's about an extremely early loss of innocence and how that affects one's relationship with the rest of the world. Um, in I know why the cage bird sings, it deals with the fact that Maya Angelou at a very young age was sexually assaulted, um, and how that changed and shaped her entire life and how that affected her relationships with her family, how that reflected her relationship with just interacting with the entire rest of the world. And we have talked a lot on the show about how with each season and everything that we learn about Artemis and Jade, you realize how much and how harsh a lot of the things that they went through were in their fictional childhoods. Not necessarily to that extent, but we have talked about how Sportsmaster is very clearly an abusive parent in the way that he trained these girls and the way that he forced them through a lot of physical and emotional pain. And so I think it is a very interesting book to have chosen for what Artemis is reading in this and just all of the different ways that it ties into things. Uh, it's a good book. It's not an easy book. It is a very, in a lot of ways, it is a very harsh book. It is a very painful book through a lot of these scenes. It's often talked about as, in some ways, a very uplifting and hopeful book by the end of it because of course we know Maya Angelou goes on to do so many other things with her life and to write an entire series of memoirs but even getting there in the first place reading it it is hard I would not recommend it to very young readers but if you have any interest check it out it's a very good book even if it is a very difficult book in a lot of ways that's my English degree <laughs> putting it away again the English lesson for the day yep and now we're done with the arc with all of the books, so people don't have to hear another book report next week. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What about you, Neil? What do you got? I can transition transition us into a comic book report instead. Uh, Go for nice. it, Neil. Well, because one of the it. other layers of that is having Onyx talk about her own experiences. Um, and one of the things she harkens back to is that her grandfather is Will Everett, the Amazing Man, which uh, he was born in 1918. And he died in team year eight, which, you know, is reference to that her not being there. Um, so he was basically like 99 or 100. Uh, thanks to the power of Ask Greg 25588. Eight. Um, <laughs> but there was actually a character named Amazing Man um, who appeared in the Golden Age comics in the 19 thir late 30s. Um, but that was actually like published by a different company and then kind of put out there as like, no, these are okay to use. Um, so the original creator was William Bill Everett. Um, so that's where the name came from. Um, but yeah, he had his sons and grandsons of the same name picking up the mantle. Um, a very interesting, absorbing powers. But as far as I can tell, like, does Onyx have any powers? I don't know. But also, like, comics wise, she's like in no way tied back to him. So I just think that's just a cool reference point. Uh, because why not? There are many DC characters to use, and we should use them at all times. Um, so that's that's the amazing man. Now that is that pales in comparison to why I don't know why I like this character so much. It's literally what I wrote in my notes. But I love Shade. <laughs> I just do. Uh, also, he and Raish go way back, capital W A Y back, according to Greg on two five eight two three. And the reason that is is because in the newer continuity, Shade was born in the 1800s. And due to his powers connecting him to the Shadowlands, he is immortal. Interesting. And so yeah. I don't know where that lands in, in Young Justice. I would assume that some essence of it is there if he's referring to him and Raish going way back. Um, but basically that connection to the Shadowlands is like how he 
transports people. You're basically dipping in and out through those spaces and places. But his power set is absurd in the comics. Uh, Like summoning forth demons from the Shadow Realm and having them do things. And in his like live action appearance in Stargirl, basically that's what happens is like the Shadowlands is an inherently somewhat evil place. And if he loses his like strength of will to some degree, then sometimes things will just take over him uh, and just like work through him, those demons. Also like creating shadows and different things and then can get blown up, but will eventually just come back together. Um, yeah. But again, I cannot have said born in the 1800s. Um, and just been kicking around since then. Typically, wow. typically in the the villain sometimes, not villain other times. So I think, um, yeah, I love this iteration in Young Justice, uh, and I also love that he double crossed Lady Shiva and just disappeared. It was like, I'd like to tender my resignation now. Woo! Off into the shadows. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. It's freelance. Do you know where how he how he got his powers? Did you, did you happen to come across anything um, on that? Um, I did not. Because originally, the very original iteration was that it was like a mechanical ma- manipulation. It was almost like gadgetry to manipulate shadows. But then the d- much darker version um, where he yeah, connected to the shadow lands and demons. Um, I think it was after his wife passed away um, that he dipped into the powers. Interesting. Yeah, he's a he's at for characters in this show. Characters that only have a few moments can sometimes be like, "Wow, that's a, I okay." The way they look, the way they act, the way they're acted, the way they're they're written, the voice actors. It's like God, I want to know a little bit more. This is an interesting take on X, Y, or Z. Like I want, I want, I want to know what's going on with the Hawks. You know, I've been saying that since you know early a compilation on. Of, like, of every time Rich just says, "I just want to know what's up with the Hawks." <laughs> I want to know what's up with the Hawks. Okay, ready? And cut in. There it is. Uh, I want to know what's up with the Hawks. So, like, there's all, so many characters that are just beautifully well-designed, and I want to I want to know more about it. Um, so, I'm with you on the shade thing. Is this why he wears a top hat and cane? Because he's 1800s and he hasn't upgraded his wardrobe? Yeah, so the cane, the cane originally is where, like, all of his, like, mechanical shadow powers um, were associated. Um, so then, like, that's a holdover from the original iteration. And then, yeah. Nice. Anything else? Nope. That's it. <laughs> Actually, I just saw one note. Did you mention this about Sensei's oh, previous meditation space? I, I just feel like if Jade could have flown that helicopter that far, <laughs> maybe just landing it would have been okay. But uh, no. I think she did it on no. purpose. I think she totally did it cool on purpose. Cool guys don't look at explosions. <laughs> they just jump out of helicopters. <laughs> That's funny. Stick around. Class is in session. All right, in our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. Speaking from the professional standpoint and a fan, having Clark have such a beautiful conversation with Jonathan and have Jonathan's reaction be the way that it was hit home so accurately that I reached out to Greg and I was like, this was gorgeous. This was a beautiful, beautiful thing that was in here that I did not expect. And he, as Neil said, gave all of his credit, all the credit to his daughter, Erin, who uh, was a guest, the link that we have in the show notes, um, guest on a podcast called The Reflective Teacher. Erin's a preschool teacher and has talked on many occasions with teachers and parents and educators about talking to kids about death. And as a hospice nurse myself, it's a conversation that comes up a lot, particularly when you have a parent who's younger, who either has a disease or has something that is uh, causing a rapid decline. And they will ask uh, other, either the other, the spouse, the partner, other family members will say, should we have the child here or not? And my answer has always been, you need to involve them in the process. The reason why People have, as adults, have so many issues now talking about death or having discussions about advanced directives or what's going on at the end of life is because we don't make it a part of what we do. In uh, in the United States, it's not really a part of our culture that we talk about enough. In this case, from a writing perspective, what I want to say is use your resources. 
if you're going to have a conversation and it with between characters that's this important, talk to somebody. In this case, uh, Greg knew someone to reference. But whatever you're having to have a conversation with, use the resources. There are a lot of people out there that are happy to help out, talk about what they do for a living. I talk about this. <laughs> I've written articles on this other thing, too, about, for example, don't shock a flat line on your characters. That's not how medicine works. My response that I've gotten from writers or producers has been, uh, this isn't a medical accuracy show when it's often in a show about medicine, but it's about a dra- it's about drama. And I'm like, okay, but the actual real life thing is actually much more interesting and exciting. So maybe you could just not go with the old fashioned thing and, and learn and, and talk about it. Um, in this case, Jonathan's reaction, he simply just goes, huh? And the next thing you know, the next scene we have with him is him playing. And this is pretty much what happened with my kids. When we had a family member die, they were young. And when they asked about what happened, we were very clear with them about it in a similar conversation, not the same as Clark had. Clark's was quite beautiful. I don't know if we were that articulate. But we had a conversation with them, and they accepted it as a reality, just like, oh, If I cross the street and there's cars, I'll get hit by a car or any other safety things that you need to teach me, or this is how a refrigerator works. There is a level of understanding about life that they're doing on a daily basis. So when you're talking to a kid as young as Jonathan, a lot of times what happens is that they will process what you're saying, understand what you're saying in a way that maybe you don't even know. And they do really well. But when we don't do that, when we don't have the kids around when our family members pass away, or we don't have our kids around when our even our pets pass away, and speaking as a former veterinary nurse, if you don't have other pets around while a pet passes away, that also causes them anxiety. So keep people involved in that talking process. And if you're going to be doing something this important, if you're going to be doing something that you don't have an expertise in, take the time to reach out, talk to somebody who knows. Maybe talk to 10 people who know uh, and get their opinions on how a scene should be approached. It's much more important than you think. Storytelling is how humans shape our lives. So something like this can even teach someone how to talk to their kid about death. And that's my Canary Debrief today. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Hashtag Beast Boys. Both of you have just added wrong. Do do we even (laughs) see Beast Boy in this episode? (laughs) No, we so we're just saying, and that's what I'm saying. We're just reminding people that this is a thing that's real, and we need to get back. Connor also is not Connor's. dead. So, I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about because I, knowing that, watching it a second time, ah, even watching it the first time, like I didn't feel like he was going to be dead, but at the same time, like I think it speaks backwards to how great that scene is because they still have to deal with the fact that it, based on their interpretation, he is gone and will not come back. Yep. And so it, it, it just to speak back to it additionally, like the fact that it works knowing full well that he is not dead and that he will return later in this season. And in spite of that, that scene still lands. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have to have a different conversation with Johnny about how, Okay, this time's weird, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, just it's like yeah, the first time you said that, that didn't, that was I yes, but this time they're really dead, right? Like, oh, it's gonna be like yeah, people told me Connor was dead, but he's fine. That's so, to deal with in season seven, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of great stuff in this episode, and that scene with with Clark just it's so good. On a on a different, possibly later note. I stand by that somebody, somebody, Artemis, Artemis should really tell Will where the heck Jade is. We're never, we never get a follow up to this by the end of the series, uh, by the end of the season, I mean. And like, I get it. There's so much going on this season. But can someone tell Will where his wife is? 
Well, you know he's <laughs> going to be seconds. at. He's like, wait, you said you were going to. You you called this and said you're going to bring somebody home. Who right? was it? Like, there's a there. <laughs> that com- It's like, yeah. So remember that cute mask. You know how Leon is the most well-adjusted toddler in the world and has fully accepted the situation in which she lives and is actually uh, surrounded by a very good support system that's going to make sure that she grows up happy and healthy, unlike Artemis or Jade. Well, it kind of triggered Cheshire. Right, yeah. (laughs) It's like, it's fine, it's fine. Your daughter's walked on the face of a dead god. She can take whatever. This is the way it happens. (laughs) <laughs> but also, though, okay, as as cool and interesting as it is in the episode, I do have to ask. It's the thing of me going, how much does Leon know about things, which we have joked since season three of like, Leon is very aware of how much superhero stuff happens in her life to the point of like, if she knows what Cheshire's mask looks like, I'm like, to the point of actually making a very good cosplay recreation of Cheshire's mask. Um, Excellent. It's the thing of like, I... How much has she been told? How much has she just figured out? How much has she been told she's not allowed to tell anybody else? There are so many questions. Every adult she interacts with is either has been or is currently in the superhero game. Yep. Everybody. Even when she goes to the play date. Like, that's everything. I mean, the play date, and you have uh, Red Tornado just throwing tornadoes around. You got little kids <laughs> using their speed. Like... There's no avoiding it. I get you know, but like she's going, she's going to school soon. Like Leon is eventually going to learn that this is not what everybody's house is like. What oh. superpowers does your friends have? That's huh? what she's going to say. That's when she's that's when Will gets some very confusing calls. Hi, uh, your daughter is saying some very disturbing things at school. I just you know, and yeah. So I as we we were joking about how we want the spinoff that's just uh infinity island and everybody healing and learning on infinity island but also i still want to get to the sitcom we will never have which is the when harper crock household that is just sometimes sometimes a family is a former assassin a clone of a superhero (laughs) their oddly adjusted toddler a dog the superhero who owns that dog and three to five random teenagers who just keep crashing on the couch whenever we find new ones. Sometimes that's a family. And I do want that, but it's largely because Cheshire's just fun. I just want more Cheshire. Whatever spinoff gets me more Cheshire, getting to learn and grow and be her best self, I'm here for it. Assassin Therapy Island. I'm trying to find... Wait. Well, this one doesn't crash the mode as much, which is interesting. Like The echoes of this one don't... Yeah, no, most of my crashing the modes are just saying, so we're never going to hear more about this, but. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, oh, cool. So we're going to end in, in just, just Damien is still there. Red hooded ninja still there. Who in the world could that be? We have no idea who red hooded ninja is. We do not know. Well, there's our crashing the mode. Crashing the modes, basically. We'd like to see more of this, but we didn't get any of the season. Me understanding that there's a million things happening in this season. Me also just wanting Jade and Will to exist in the same room for a minute, sixty seconds of screen time, please. Let them let them talk. Let them speak. <laughs> All right. And with that, I think we can zade out of the watchtower and say If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay stay well, stay whelmed, everyone. Everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. 
Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.